Hello to all of my comic book geekazoids, Dante D here, and welcome to the channel, the podcast, where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. Today, we are going to be talking about comic book trends, the comic book zeitgeist. As with anything in popular culture and entertainment, comic books went through various different stages in terms of trends. There was always some sort of trend happening in comic books that every single publisher was trying to capitalize on uh, on since the the advent of comic books in uh, the 1930s, essentially. And uh, it's going on even today. There are huge trends going on in comic books even today, and we are definitely going to get through that. So we're going to start in the 1930s. We're going to go all the way up to present day talking about the major trends in comic books so obviously the first major trend in comic books is costumed superheroes comic books were around before the 1930s but uh they weren't really super relevant in popular culture until superman leapt out of the pages of action comics number one in june 1938 with that first appearance of superman we the the birth of a medium the birth of a genre the birth of modern day pop culture essentially uh happened and with the success of superman he got a whole lot of company and there were so many publishers that were trying to capitalize on this costumed superhero trend this trend where you have this 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 character who seems like a like a man or a woman that has powers and does whatever they can to use their powers for good and to make the society better. This was especially important at the time because this was uh, wartime. Uh, World War II happened between 1938 and 1945, and people were looking to fictional characters in some cases to help them get through whether it be psychologically but they were you know some people were hoping for you know a, a costume man with an s on his chest to come down and knock out adolf hitler and just end the war uh there are hundreds probably hundreds of costume superheroes that were published in the late 1930s early 1940s during the war uh and to tell you the truth most of them did not survive so you had Superman, you had uh, Batman, you had The Flash, you had... There were just so many, so many, to the point actually where uh, there were lawsuits because eventually some of these heroes started resembling one another. The most notable of uh, of, of lawsuits was uh, between Fawcett Publications and DC Comics. Uh, Fawcett Publications, for those of you that know a little bit about comic book history, was the company that published Captain Marvel, the original Captain Marvel, Shazam, right? And uh, basically DC was arguing that the character was a little bit too similar to Superman and they wanted either to acquire the rights to this character, character or for the company to cease publication. It, they, they were, uh, this was a lengthy, these were lengthy proceedings that lasted years and years and years. And uh, eventually, as you all know, Captain Marvel, the original Captain Marvel was renamed Shazam and uh, is now a DC property. So uh, DC eventually got the, um, the rights to the original Captain Marvel. But uh, yeah, there were just so many superheroes. But after the war ended, uh, that trend died, essentially, but so did most of the uh, superheroes that were born in that era. And I think uh, the only three superheroes that survived uh, the end of World War II were Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. All the rest were, were canceled. Uh, and of course, that trend ended up dying, and the next new trend took over. And what was that trend? Well, uh, that was the trend of... Teenage drama comics, romance comics, and most notably, horror comics. So it was in this time that you're starting to see uh, characters like Archie coming to prominence. Uh, but then you're also getting uh, horror comic books that eventually exploded in popularity to the point where they started getting the attention of the mainstream and not in a good way. Uh, so 
the uh, the horror comics that were especially popular were Tales from the Crypt, uh, The Vault of Horror, uh, The Haunt of Fear. There were just so many of them. Uh, crime comics also were were a part of this this uh, this trend, and publishers just it became a game of one up one up one up one up who can outdo the other so it was ec comics uh that is most notable for starting mad magazine uh ec comics uh was the company that started this trend what they even called this new trend in comic books uh for for horror books and uh and then before you know it all these other publishers are trying to get in to capitalize on that and these books uh the way they tried to one up each other was by making who could make the um the most shocking story <laughs> now if you read some of these uh these stories today by today's standards these these books and what they were the content that they were putting out was not that bad by today's standards uh i i, I think it just in general nowadays we're pretty desensitized to um violence and things that are considered kind of messed up but back then uh, what they were doing was just you know you didn't you didn't get into that uh in that type of territory right uh so again now we have the uh, mainstream that is getting wind of this and they're starting to think that okay juvenile delinquents is being caused by this because during the 1950s there was a surge in juvenile delinquents and they were blaming this on comic books comic books alone were responsible for the surge in juvenile delinquents now if you want to look at it from a demographic perspective or uh if you are uh, you look at it from a sociological perspective uh the the surge in juvenile delinquents was probably more likely due to the surge in population uh that happened at the time so what happened after world war ii well you have the baby boom you know uh the economy was good and people started having more kids well when you have an increase in population so too do you have an increase in crime and in this case juvenile uh delinquents so uh really really interesting uh from one perspective but at the same time it was really sad for comic book publishers because they were getting all the heat for this and uh this eventually resulted in the birth of the comics code authority uh, it was basically a self-regulating body that made sure that comics were not too scary not too sexy not too violent and uh it basically rendered comic books boring as hell okay uh in my opinion post code uh comic books from the 50s uh before the advent of the silver age are boring as hell um an example of a story that you would read in, read in the 1950s is actually george rr R. martin's uh <laughs> description uh he said that they became so tame to the point where uh, a superman comic book would be something like you know Superman saves the day by, you know, toasting hot dogs at a school picnic, you know, or by using his x-ray vision to heat an old woman's porridge, you know, like stuff that's just super boring. They they just started trying to make these heroes look more like upstanding citizens. So parents would be confident in the books that their children were reading, but this did not translate into good sales. What? so ever <laughs> it's also the time where you're starting to get uh books that um were meant to be horror books but they were disguising themselves as more kind of science fiction suspense so uh, marvel was actually uh noted to uh do this kind of stuff right so the, you know they had tales of suspense okay uh you know tales to astonish right these were all books that were meant to be horror books uh but they because of the code they had to kind of change their wording and um they ended up just putting out morality tales in these books now later on we know that uh these you know tales to astonish you know um tales of suspense all these other, they they gave us uh so many uh notable heroes 
uh, in the Silver Age, you know, like Iron Man and Spider Man and Thor, you know, Journey into Mystery, like all these, all these uh, anthology suspense books. Uh, but at the time before the advent of the Silver Age, these books were just giving us, you know, morality tales. So uh, that is the uh, teenage drama, romance, and horror trend, which eventually, because of the uh, the strict limitations that were put upon publishers by the Comics Code Authority. Publishers then thought it would be a good idea to maybe start working with superheroes again because obviously they can't do anything with horror or, you know, or anything like that or crime. So they started experimenting with superheroes again and uh, that was the next big trend and that is costume superheroes part two when the superheroes had a revival that was uh, a trend so costume heroes had a second uh huge trend in in comic book publishing and that is during the silver age so uh 1958 with the flash in showcase number four we have the birth of the silver age and that is where we start seeing superheroes uh coming to prominence again of course marvel at the time they didn't have any superheroes so of course they had to jump on this trend as well if they wanted to stay relevant so this is where we see the dc characters getting a whole lot of company um from marvel comics so uh the silver age saw the birth of the most popular costume superheroes to this day so we see the fantastic four spider-man iron man thor um captain america was even revived like this was just a huge huge revival and publishers were just trying to to capitalize on this popularity moving into the 1970s uh 1970s in my opinion was kind of like a uh a wild west for for comic books uh this is where now you know you're starting to see the comics code authority the rules relaxing a bit and uh, publishers are now trying to experiment with different genres right so yeah superheroes were still popular but they weren't really what was in the uh, the zeitgeist at the time uh what i really think kind of was the trend of the 1970s was uh sword and sorcery comics okay so uh conan the barbarian huge huge book uh from the 1970s and uh was was uh was a titan for marvel comics and a huge huge seller to the point where at one at one point in the 70s it was actually selling almost as much as amazing spider-man which is which is crazy to think that but also uh the 1970s was a time where we saw this trend in comics dealing with social issues and comics trying to be socially relevant now uh in my opinion this isn't a trend that really kind of took off but uh, it was something that you were seeing in the early 1970s most notably with the famous amazing spider-man drug issues Okay, uh, Stan Lee was approached uh, by, I think it was like the U.S. Health Department or something, to do a story on uh, the, the dangers of comic books. So, long story short, this was done in The Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, and then a few months later, DC did their own uh, anti-drug story in uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Uh, so you're getting a lot of this social relevance stuff, but then you're also getting uh, another big trend. So this would be the third big trend of the era, which would be minority superheroes. So uh, up until this point, up until the 1970s, uh, early 60s, you're you're seeing mostly white superheroes. You're getting white male for the most part. Uh, some, some females, obviously. Uh, but Marvel... Uh, they they were the ones that spearheaded this this movement in minority superheroes. They were the first ones, I think, really to do it. And uh, we start seeing heroes that are African-American, heroes that are Asian. You're starting to see uh, more women uh, coming coming in as, uh, as superheroes. Uh, you're even starting to see black women like, uh, like Storm, right? Uh, you're getting heroes that are not necessarily all american this is especially true of the x-men you know you have colossus in uh, giant size x-men he he's he's russian 
uh, which was, I think, a huge step for Marvel because at the time, you know, we're in the middle of a, or the U.S. was in the middle of a cold, cold war, and uh, to have a Russian as a hero was uh, was big, it was big of Marvel. I think um, you have uh, Nightcrawler, who's from Germany. You have Wolverine, who's Canadian. Uh, just a lot of different, diverse superheroes. Um, but I really think it was done in a way that wasn't really in your face. Um, it was the the diverse backgrounds of these superheroes was besides the point but uh they ended up they did it kind of subtly and uh it caught on uh dc was late uh to this um to this trend i think that it's probably t towards the end of the 1970s where you're starting to see a little bit more uh uh, minority heroes coming out of DC. The one that comes to my mind immediately is Black Lightning from DC. But uh, yeah, 1970s, like I said, Wild West uh, and three big trends going on in the 70s. Those were sword and sorcery, social relevance, and minority superheroes. Uh, just, just great. But also, and then I think... You also could make an argument that uh, licensed comics were a little bit of a trend, too, in the 70s. Uh, you know, you had Star Wars in the late 70s, especially. Uh, Star Wars was actually the number one seller for Marvel and actually saved Marvel <laughs> in the late 70s. Because, the you know, comic book publishers were not doing well in the 70s. But uh, you know, then you start seeing, like, the Micronauts. Um, Conan is actually a licensed property as well. Uh so, yeah, but I wouldn't really say that's that was like a huge trend. That was, I think, something more Marvel was doing. Uh, I can't think off the top of my head anyway of any licensed comics that uh, DC was doing at the time. If you can think of any, please, please uh, let me know. Now, moving out of the uh, 1970s, the next big trend was... Uh, the trend in comic book distribution, actually, and I would call this the direct market trend. So, in the in the nineteen late nineteen seventies, early nineteen eighties, you're starting to see comic book specialty shops, comic book shops popping up, only selling comic books, and uh, comic book publishers wanted to jump on this because this was a great money making uh, initiative for them and a great money making opportunity. Uh, because if you know a little bit about comic book distribution before the the advent and the rise of the the direct market, you'll know that uh, any any books, any comics that were sold on the newsstands, they were sold to the newsstands by comic book wholesalers. Well, for example, say you ordered fifty copies of Amazing Spider-Man number one hundred and fifty, and you didn't you sold all but say ten copies. Well, all you had to do, you weren't stuck with those 10 copies. All you had to do was just tear off the covers of those unsold copies of Amazing Spider-Man so you couldn't sell them. You sent in the covers uh, to the wholesaler and then Marvel would give you a credit for your next order of Ama Amazing Spider-Man. So comic book publishers were essentially the ones that were losing money from this because they had to pay for the printing. Uh, and then it would be a loss for them, not for the news vendors or uh, the liquor store, 7-Elevens, whatever. I, actually, it was really funny because uh, some I, I heard that there were some stores, some shops like, you know, like dime stores and 7-Elevens, uh, liquor stores, whatever. They um, they would tear off the covers, uh, send in the covers to get their credit, but then they would illegally sell the uh, coverless comics uh, for like a nickel or something like that, something really cheap. They'd be like, you know, I'm not going to throw these out. If I can make it a couple cents off of them, why not? So they would like throw them all in a box and be like, hey, you want you want these coverless comics? You can get them for like a nickel each, right? Um, so uh, I, I thought that was uh, that was kind of funny, right? Uh, but with the r rise of the direct market, now comic book stores uh, and and the vendors were the ones that would take the loss if a book, particular book, would not sell. So. You, you know, the comic book, and this is how comic books are distributed to this day as well. So a comic book shop would buy, say, uh, 50 copies of the next issue of Batman. And uh, say that comic book store sold all but 20 issues of that Batman issue, um, issue release. Uh, 
they were stuck with those 20 copies. Uh, they would not be able to send them back in for a credit. Uh, they would be stuck with those and they would have to find a way to sell them or just take the loss in that way. Uh, so clearly comic book publishers wanted to jump on that train because they would not, this was a great way for them to not lose money. Uh, but not only that, so it wasn't, so this trend was not exclusive just to the distribution method. Now you're starting to see uh, comic book publishers releasing particular titles or special edition graphic novels uh, that were only going to be released in comic book stores. And this was just kind of like uh, some incentive uh, to bring people into comic book stores because they their ultimate goal was to get their product all in comic book shops so they would not take that loss. Now, eventually that backfired for them. Uh, as we all know, uh, with, with a comic book crash in the 1990s, we've done uh, an ep episodes on this and videos on this. Uh, I might have to do a remake at some point to, to, to post it as a podcast and talk about it because it's such a fascinating era in comic books. But uh, nevertheless, uh, there we were. You know, we have the direct market trend where comic book publishers are trying to get their products sold exclusively in comic book stores. Uh, the next big trend, I feel, and this was a, a big 1980s trend, uh, in my opinion, uh, and that is the trend of superhero teams. 1980s was huge, huge for superhero teams. Big, big trend in comic books. Uh, I think this was due in part to the popularity of the X-Men. Uh, if there is one comic book that I think has made a comeback for itself, I think it's the, the X-Men. And I don't mean that by today's standards. But if, if I told you that when the X-Men originally launched in the 1960s, that it was a failure, essentially, uh, would you believe me? Some of you that don't know anything about comic book history, don't know much about comic book history, would probably be like, no, it's impossible. Like X-Men have been around for years. Yeah, they have been around for years. But to, believe it or not, the X-Men did not become a household name at Marvel until Chris Claremont took over the X-Men. Okay, so it was not a not a good selling book at all. Uh, then Cl Chris Claremont takes over in with X Men ninety four, and uh, and then you have giant size X Men. Okay, now the 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 popularity of the X Men was not instantaneous. It took a while uh, for the popularity to grow and for people to kind of jump on the X Men train. Uh, X-Men originally in the seventies was actually a bi-monthly, uh, book and they weren't even publishing it monthly. Uh, by 1980, uh, the X-Men became a monthly book and, uh, then towards the end of the eighties, uh, it became, uh, twice monthly. So, I mean, that's, that's just crazy to think that it went from being published every other month to then being published twice a month, okay? So the X-Men shoot up in popularity to the point where they're pretty much the number one selling book at Marvel. And uh, people and, uh, and the other publishers are now thinking, you know, notably uh, DC. Uh, they were then thinking like, okay, we need to get some more superhero teams out because, you know, the household names at DC were not like Superman and Batman were not doing very well. Uh, so now you're starting to see the Teen Titans pop up. And then of course the X-Men continued in popularity throughout the eighties. Uh, Alpha flight was actually a huge selling book for, for Marvel two uh, for a period of time. It was just, just nuts. So this big trend in superhero teams, then we move on to the grim and gritty trend. Uh, and this, I think, started with DC started this trend for sure uh, with The Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen. So uh, you now have this shift in the tone of comic books. Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns are now grim and gritty, making comics more for adults rather than, than children. But uh, that was kind of besides the point. Uh, so now comic books in general are, take this shift and become darker. 
to the point where the stories become senselessly and needlessly violent and the books become about the violence as opposed to being secondary right so uh they, they i think they did miss the point um with uh with dark knight and uh in watchmen but uh that trend uh this is when dc was ruling it right now when dc was ruling it with um with watchmen and uh and dark knight so uh yeah that started the grim and gritty trend which led us in to the next trend which is the macho trend so uh in the early the late 1980s and the early uh, 1990s was huge for um action movies you know like schwarzenegger and stallone and all these big muscled uh characters so of course that translates uh into comic books and now all the comic book characters are becoming macho and uh big and beefy and with these giant guns right you know like you have like cable uh i know like rob liefeld liked to draw a lot of these giant you know macho characters but even like superman and batman became pretty uh pretty buff and macho as well right so um really really awesome to see uh that trend the books were fun uh wasn't the best writing <laughs> by any means but that th these books were fun very covers Next huge trend. This is a trend actually that continues to this day. Uh, so in an, in, an, uh, in an effort to increase sales uh, of particular issues and to increase the perceived collectability of particular issues, uh, comic book companies started publishing special edition covers and multiple covers of the same issue. And uh, that did wonders for the sales of comic books for a short period of time but at the end of the day it uh it backfired on them um because once people got the idea and got the picture and the message that you know new comic books are not collectible and you're not going to be able to flip them for profit well the uh the comic book industry took a hit that trend actually goes hand in hand with uh, the next one, which is the gimmicks. The 90s was huge for gimmicks. Now, you can make an argument that, you know, variant covers were a gimmick in and of themselves. But uh, I think the the story gimmicks were were super interesting, you know. So you're, you're starting to see um, these gimmick storylines to increase sales, like the death of Superman, the, the, the breaking of the bat, uh, the clone saga. Uh, just so many like the 90s was notorious for these uh, gimmick storylines uh you know they all did it all the publishers did it and uh again that was another contribution to uh that backfired that contributed to uh the the comic book crash and the bubble and the implosion it was just it was just sad marvel actually declared bank bankruptcy bankruptcy in 1997 so really kind of crazy um uh, <clears throat> the the night the early 2000s was i would call it um a dark age the dark ages of comic books uh not dark in terms of story but uh kind of like in terms of like there was nothing really a lot there wasn't a lot going on this was actually the lowest time for circulation for comic books uh comic book circulation didn't start picking up again until probably closer to you know the 2000 teens like the 2010 era uh rarely were books uh, during this time selling over 100,000 copies uh so really really kind of kind of sad to see that but uh nevertheless uh circulation did pick up didn't pick up didn't recover at all uh was never again like it was in the 1990s and to this day even but uh, it did pick up, and uh, the next trend, I think, you had a, you had a brief trend of zombies, uh, you know, like with Marvel zombies. But uh, I don't think that, I don't think DC ever picked that up. Correct me if I'm wrong. I wasn't really, I, I don't read a lot of comics from the um, from the early 2000s, to be honest. Uh, but the next big trend, I think, was uh, relaunches. Uh, DC, I think, kind of uh, spearheaded this one with the new 52. So they re relaunched their whole universe. Well, then Marvel followed and relaunched their whole universe. And then <laughs> you just had relaunch after relaunch after relaunch. To this day, I still think they're relaunching their books. I don't know. I haven't read a new comic book uh, since 2016. 
Uh, but at the time, uh, that's actually why I got out of comic um, reading new comic books was because of this constant relaunch. These constant relaunches. They, I think, relaunched Amazing Spider-Man like three or four times <laughs> between 2010 and like 2016. It was just mind blowing. Okay. Now, of course, they were doing this to uh, obviously try to stimulate sales because everyone loves those number ones, right? So they thought, you know, we're going to increase our sales by relaunching with a brand new number one. Uh, and that got old really, really fast. DC after the new 52 relaunched again with rebirth. Uh, just relaunches are annoying in my opinion anyway. Uh, and then finally the next big trend, which I think is, uh, relevant today is, uh, Social justice consciousness. So uh, we did see some social justice uh, and uh, social issue consciousness in the 1970s, but uh, not to the extent that we're seeing it today. So uh, you're seeing uh, characters that are retconned um, to, you know, like like Spider-Man. You have like Miles Morales. You're having characters from diverse backgrounds. You're getting more Latino characters, um, black characters, uh, you know, Asian characters. You had an Asian Hulk for a while. Especially uh, you have a lot of these characters that are retconned to be female. You had a female Thor for a while. Um, you're having people from religious minorities. So you're, you're seeing some Muslim characters like uh, Kamala Khan, uh, as well as, uh, characters from sexual minorities. Uh, most recently you had, uh, you're seeing some more gay characters and most recently you have, uh, Superman, um, the John Kent Superman who, uh, came out as bisexual. Okay, so and that was uh, very controversial. We did it. We actually did an episode on that. You can check it out on the channel or on our podcast if uh, if you'd like. This is this is a this is a big trend right now. Uh, not necessarily the most popular uh, among fans, but nevertheless, publishers continue to do it. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too too much, uh, just because we have talked about it a lot on this channel, and uh, I'm not going to give you any of my opinions on that or anything right now, like right now uh but uh this is definitely something we can continue to talk about um in another episode uh or not because like i said we've talked about it quite a bit uh and i think people are actually tired of hearing about it <laughs> so uh would really like to hear from you all though uh those are all of my perceived trends over the years uh, if there are any I missed, please let me know. Would love to hear from you all. Always love interacting with you in the comments and uh, interacting with you on social media if you're listening to this as a podcast. But nevertheless, those are comic book trends, comic book zeitgeist that I think are most relevant. What are your most relevant? What are some of the trends that you've caught on to in comic books over the years? Once again, love to hear from you all. Uh, if, if you're watching this on YouTube, again, in the comments, you can reach out to me. Or uh, you also can reach out to me on social media. If you're listening to this as a podcast, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr. You can find me at Geekery D. Thank you all so much for joining me. Till next time, this is Dante D signing off. I will see you all in the next episode. <laughs>